I'm delighted uh, to be introducing uh, tonight's uh, speaker, uh, President Michael A. Fitz, President of Tulane uh, University in New Orleans. Uh, the UPPP Foundation has led uh, the way in revitalizing how the civic university agenda uh, has been able to establish itself in the United Kingdom. I was delighted uh, when I was the UK's universities uh, minister to be able to really support the civic universities network. It's been fantastic to see it go from strength uh, to strength. Uh, it's in this vein that this is the third of a series of lectures from overseas universities' presidents on the role they play in their institutions and how their institutions play that critical uh, civic uh, role in their local community. Uh, we're honored tonight to be addressed by such a leading voice in US higher education. President Fitz is the 15th uh, president of Tulane University and since joining Tulane in 2014, President Fitz has repositioned uh, the university by taking advantage of its natural strengths its unique history, location, culture, size, and structure. And under his uh, leadership, Tulane has become a world-class academic environment that fosters path-breaking interdisciplinary research, innovative teaching, and a diverse and inclusive campus culture, and a holistic student experience. President Fitz, a graduate of both Harvard and Yale uh, universities, began his teaching career at the University of Pennsylvania Law School uh, serving there as 14 years uh, as Dean. Previously, President Fitz worked as an attorney uh, in the US Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, uh, which serves as outside counsel to the President, the White House, and the Cabinet. President Fitz has written extensively on presidential power, separation of powers, executive branch decision-making, and improving the structure of political parties and ministry of law and perhaps certain politicians and governments might take some lessons from his work uh, for the future. Uh, please give a warm welcome tonight uh, to our speaker, President Michael A. Fitz. I look forward to what he has to say. Thank you. So I, I must say, um, you could tell from that introduction, I'm a political junkie. Um, and so it was really special to spend this evening with Chris finding out about uh, all the issues before po po politics in, uh, in the UK. And uh, I promise not to repeat anything that you said um, with that. I also have to say whenever you go to a, a new location like this, you, you get education. Um, and I must say, out of the most unexpected places, um, literally, I learned tonight that the first thing I need to do when I get back to New Orleans is start a cricket club. Um, we will become a national leader in cricket. I also learned that when I leave, I need to put in my application to become a member because it takes 29 years to become a member of the uh, cricket club. So, um, so I know I'm under a lot of pressure because Richard said um, there's an open bar after this. So. Um, uh, my apologies, um, but I will say um, this is truly an honor for me uh, to be here um, and uh, literally I am a huge um, advocate of what the UPP Foundation is about, which is strengthening the partnerships between universities and their surrounding communities. It resonates with me, uh, resonates with Tulane and New Orleans if you know anything about us uh, and it, its presidents and I was really delighted to accept uh, this invitation. But let me note in starting out, when I learned the location of this lecture, I was not entirely aware of just how iconic Lourdes is. I'm a huge baseball fan. And of course, baseball and cricket are both played with a bat and a ball. But that's about where the similarities end. So I have to say, I did a little bit of research on this venue. I learned uh, that Thomas Lord established his first cricket ground almost 250 years ago, and that the current ground has stood on this spot since 1814. Lourdes has clearly stood the test of time, and time has tested Lourdes, with fire, insect infestation, and two world wars, among other challenges. And Lourdes has adapted, relocating, rebuilding, renovating, and improving the pitch, connecting cricket's international audience by hosting the World Cup, 
opening membership to women, making the stands accessible to fans with mobility challenges, and committing to environmentally sustainable operations. At the same time, the Lords has preserved beloved traditions, like the Father Time weather vane, and created new ones, like the ringing of the five-minute bell. Now, at this point, you have to be starting to wonder why I crossed the Atlantic to tell you things you already probably knew about Lourdes. And yes, I am a sports enthusiast, and as a baseball fan, I find the history of cricket especially fascinating. But the history of Lourdes isn't just an interesting story, it's a model for what I'm going to talk about this evening. The story I'm going to tell you is really about how institutions evolve and stay relevant. First and foremost, they must have a core vision of who they are and what their comparative strengths are. And over time, they must also constantly reassess and update that core vision in order to overcome the inevitable institutional challenges and respond to a constantly changing uh, 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 civil order. Now, um, Lourdes understands this. It has evolved while always being fundamentally a shrine to the sport of cricket. I don't think we'll see Lourdes pivot to being a baseball stadium anytime soon. The story of Lourdes stands out to me because there are very few types of institutions that manage to survive and thrive over decades, let alone centuries. In the business world, for example, there are not many companies that have managed to stand the test of time. Of the top 50 US companies in 1917, only two have survived to 2017, two, over 100 years. Even more telling, out of 12 of the largest US companies in 2000, only four were still among the top 12 in 2018, 18 years later. By and large, however, universities survive and thrive. The oldest universities in the United Kingdom are older than the United Kingdom. The oldest universities in the United States are older than the United States. Now, I'll grant you that your oldest universities have a few hundred years of seniority over ours, but our higher ed institutions are probably more heterogeneous than their elders in the UK and, and Europe. This is partly due to our mix of public and private uh, universities and the different financial pressures. But beyond this, our founders also had different motivations and different ideas about what each university would do. Some of those institutions, Princeton or Yale, for example, are really rooted originally in the liberal arts and have historically been more internally focused and introspective as institutions. Others, like Stanford or the University of Pennsylvania, were founded more outward-looking, pragmatic, and professional approach. My talk this evening is a case study focused on one American university that lands squarely in the latter category. Tulane University in New Orleans. Tulane was founded originally in 1834 as a medical school to fight a pandemic, yellow fever. As a result, its institutional outlook has always been more outward looking, pragmatic, interdisciplinary, and socially impactful. Obviously an issue that's important for this lecture in the UPP Foundation. This is also reflected in the fact that Tulane University founded the first school of public health in the United States. Because Tulane's vision is somewhat distinctive, it obviously does not serve as a universal roadmap. I can assure you that our vision is different from hundreds of universities in the United States and around the world. This is a story about one particular institution, how it's navigating issues in higher education. For historical reasons, my story is framed by two crises that I think the world is quite aware of. One, Hurricane Katrina, which literally devastated New Orleans and Tulane University, and COVID-19 that impacted the entire world. They tested Tulane's identity as this outward-looking university. The history I'm recounting reveals both aspects to the Tulane story. For out of each crisis, and over time, Tulane has refined an extended model as an outward-looking academic institution. It's a perfect example, really, of President John F. Kennedy's famous line that out of every crisis comes an opportunity. 
This is most obvious in how Tulane has evolved from a focus on public service, which I'll talk about, to service learning, to translational research. Defined and deepened its interdisciplinary philosophy, which is really quite unique, and recently launched a new research and medical campus in the heart of New Orleans, which serves physically and philosophically as the modern embodiment of our, in a sense, impactful uh, impact. In this sense, the crux of this talk is about uh, the evolving relationship of an outward-looking university with its city. Perhaps I'm a bit biased, but I don't really think there's another university that has quite the same relationship with their city the way Tulane University um, does. Now, one of my favorite university professors who taught me when I was in college was a man by the name of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who, uh, who was a, really a renowned urbanologist and later served in the United States Senate. Um, I also think as ambassador, he declared war on the Soviet Union at one moment, but well, I won't talk about that. Um, he famously said, as in his urbanologist uh, hat, that the way to create a great city is to create a great university and wait 200 years. <laughs> now, no coincidence, I quote Moynihan, Tulane is 11 years away from our bicentennial. And despite historic challenges, we are in the process, we hope, of making his prediction a vision. And as I will describe, a lot of this goes to the relationship we're building in a downtown campus, uh, which we think will really create an urban uh, renaissance in New Orleans. Now, finally, most new universities are not defined by their cities or vice versa but Tulane is. There are significant debates today about the value and importance of higher education, and what I'm, the story I'm talking about really does, in a sense, focus on that. It's a story about how one university is seeking to address the questions by pursuing academic excellence at the same time as social impact, bringing the two together. Um, and ultimately, it's a story, I think, about some ways in which higher education can improve its reputation across the country uh, and across the world. Now, to start the story, Tulane's place in higher education was forever framed by the events surrounding Hurricane Katrina. And my guess is if I asked everyone in this room, I asked about Tulane University, half of you, the first thing you say, oh yeah, that was Hurricane Katrina. Uh, Tulane came back after Hurricane uh, Katrina. And that's really why it's, this is an appropriate place really uh, for me to sort of start the history. These events provide unique insights, let me say, because I actually was not at Tulane at the time. I was like you, I was miles and miles away. Uh, in August of 2005, I was dean of the law school at the University of Pennsylvania on the East Coast. I heard about this major hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico heading for New Orleans. By the time Hurricane Katrina made landfall, it had weakened enough that most thought New Orleans had dodged a bullet. By then, however, the levees failed. The levees that, in a sense, protect the city, and the region was turned upside down. The world watched in horror as 80% of the city filled with water and residents were rescued from rooftops. The grim statistics mounted. Well over 1,000 casualties, people died, 20,000 people were stranded at the iconic Superdome in downtown New Orleans, over a million people were displaced. And of course, um, the question at that moment was, would New Orleans come back? Would it ever be a major city? And of course, those of us in higher ed also watch as our peers in New Orleans area confronted unprecedented challenges. After shuttering for the autumn term, Tulane developed, in fact, a renewal plan to guide the university's recover and provide a roadmap for the future. This plan represented the most, and this is a quote from a report, the most dramatic reorganization of a major American university in more than a century. It also served to reaffirm, strengthen, and focus the university's academic mission and to build on its mission and core values. As I watched Tulane make this remarkable recovery from afar, I never imagined that I would actually ultimately be president of this institution. And now that I've taken the helm, 
for nearly a decade, I've come to understand literally what the key factor was in repositioning Tulane after Katrina, which has been a subject of discussion around the world. Katrina did not chain Tulane identity. It reinforced that identity and reaffirmed it. As I've noted, Tulane's origin was unique. I don't know if there's another American university was founded in exactly this way. It was founded as a medical school in response to a pandemic, a public crisis. That was the DNA of the institution. We're thus an outward facing institution at, at the beginning, from the very start, found, uh, you know, founded to solve problems. Uh, Katrina re-energized that commitment to the city. It also demonstrated our worth to the local community in an unprecedented way. Universities often struggle to come up with, you know, explaining what their importance is to their community. But in the aftermath of Katrina, our real impact on the city of New Orleans was suddenly crystal clear. As the city's largest employer and with thousands of students returning to our campuses from around the country, Tulane's decision to reopen was absolutely critical to the city's recover. So I ask everybody in the room to consider your own universities and surrounding communities. Has anyone ever been faced with the natural experiment of what the community would look like without the university there? New Orleans was. In almost unique in American and really international higher education, not only because of its size, because of the possible exodus of tens of thousands of students and jobs. Would Tulane come back after Katrina? As a result of that, the city recognized politically and philosophically the essential importance of the university to the well-being of the community. I can't overstate the importance of that psychologically. It also understood, I should note, the importance of the university reassessing its relationship with the city after that event. As part of the renewal plan, the university implemented a public service requirement for all undergraduate students. Every single undergraduate student had to perform public service. There's no other major research university then, and to my knowledge now in the United States, that has a requirement uh, such as that. Our academic uh, program was evolving to come more recently deeply connected to the community, and this transformation led us to see a new kind of student applying to Tulane. Students were coming to be part of this, part of this public service, part of this rebuilding of New Orleans. The other significant component of the renewal plan was the decision to bring all of our undergraduate schools under a single unit with one portal entry. Students would no longer apply separately to our programs in business, architecture, public health, engineering, liberal arts, but they apply to Tulane. And in a sense, after they arrived at Tulane, in a sense, they would connect and become part of those schools. That was, uh, I would say, uh, an embrace of interdisciplinarity uh, like uh, we'd never seen. Uh, it was highly controversial. Um, you know, in other words, students didn't come in cabin with a specific career. But it reflected, in a sense, a doubling down of us as a university that came out of a medical school and the, the, the process of medicine in crossing fields to deal with problems. Um, as I will explain, uh, this approach, this interdisciplinary approach, uh, really is, has, in years since, pr provided incredible dividends in research, in innovation, and skyrocketing admissions. So it's now been 18 years since Katrina, and there's one other event I just want to briefly uh, talk about. Uh, history shifted once again on a global, this time, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the second crisis that challenged Tulane, in a sense, to think about its relationship with the city. In light of our experience with Hurricane Katrina, Tulane was in many respects, I think, better positioned than certainly most universities in the United States to navigate this crisis. We knew that we had emerged as a stronger institution after the uh, Katrina experience, and we're prepared to leverage what we learned. One key lesson was to keep sight of one of the fundamental characteristics that defines our identity, that's our relational, uh, in a sense, engaged culture, COVID-19 disrupted this culture, which characterizes both Tulane and New Orleans. 
the graduation celebrations, the music festivals, crawfish, all these things are so much a part of us and we're so critical. Now, I have to say, I mentioned crawfish. I think you call it crayfish here. Do I have it? Do I have it right? Anyway, whatever you call it, they're really delicious. And I think if you make it to New Orleans, you ought to, you ought to try our crosses, but they're a lot of work, I, I should note. Um, anyway, we never figured out how to be socially distanced and have crawfish, uh, eat crawfish. Uh, but we did ultimately decide that we needed to return in person uh, uh, to Tulane. And uh, let me say in terms of a history, our returning to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina was sort of nationally defining. We came back when the city wasn't even back and um, started classes. And that was our model, really, when we're thinking about COVID-19. It was very successful. 85% of our students came back after Katrina. And that underscored our decision in COVID-19 to bring our students back. We had recommendations from our public health people, our medical people, six committees. Uh, but again, let me say it was very controversial. Um, I was, I, I, you know, I think anybody who's been in Parliament would sympathize with some of the comments I got when I said we were going to open up. We were literally, this was the fall of 2020, we were one of the few national universities to bring students back on campus engaged. Um, and uh, by comparison, Princeton and Yale and Harvard uh, were remote for the most part and just online. We thought it was critical to bring our students back and we thought uh, we could do it. I won't go into all the different things we did, uh, but literally we went through huge protocols. We did a million tests. I became a testing czar. Um, you know, I literally, uh, a COVID test, we tested everybody three times a week. Um, and we, uh, uh, we built temporary classrooms across the campus um, and we built, uh, took over hotels for isolation space. Um, and as a result of that, uh, we literally brought um, everyone back uh, to the community. The benefit was enormous. It was highly controversial, but it was part of our psyche and our history of Katrina that really led us uh, to, that, to that outcome. Uh, we uh, we jump-started the local economy, which relies heavily on tourism, uh, because literally we brought back 20,000 people to New Orleans to study in classes. We didn't lay anybody off. We still, uh, in a sense, went through um, uh, all the research that was going on uh, on the campus. Uh, we literally were also able to test the community. We provide t uh, testing. Uh, vaccinations for the community, for the incarcerated, for first responders. Uh, and finally, we were able in the middle of the pandemic to continue our research. We were very much involved in research on the vaccines and in the pandemic. Uh, so this literally, uh, in a sense, I, I don't think we ever would have done it had it not been for Katrina. We understood we could do it. Um, I should say we, in, in the end, in retrospect, clearly protected the health and safety. Everyone was much safer. Uh, on campus than they would have been had they not. Um, and it, it really underscored uh, for us um, what we learned and our, our role within the community. So there are, in a sense, three changes I'll briefly uh, comment on that have come out of this history of COVID uh, and Katrina um, that really speak to this relationship between a university uh, and its community. Uh, the first is uh, what was referred to as public service. We brought students back from Katrina, and everybody was to perform uh, public service. Um, but we since recognized there's more to public service than just sort of hanging sheetrock. Um, really, it's this transition to service learning, incorporating it into your academic program, uh, so that literally uh, that faculty are thinking about experiential learning, what's the way to teach in a way that connects with the community and as a product uh, in, in this community. Um, and faculty are literally drawn to Tulane because of that. Um, and students, I think, are much more energized about their uh, uh, program. Uh, um, and in a sense, it makes us part of a, a revolution in pedagogy around uh, uh, experiential learning. Uh, and, and, and really, uh, faculty, in a sense, figure out ways to bring that into part of their uh, curriculum. The Mellon Foundation just gave us a major grant for our PhD students. 
uh, to teach them, in a sense, how to think about bringing experiential learning and public service into their classes. So as they go off and become faculty around the country, this, in a sense, become, can become a, a model uh, more, uh, more generally. Um, so it's also, I think, changed the relationship between us and the organizations uh, in, the, in the community. There's much more of a reciprocal relationship. Uh, public service, you know, used to be sort of the university would come down and provide service. Now it's much more of a partnership with the local community, um, which I think everyone can benefit. Um, the second major change after Hurricane Katrina was our single porter uh, undergraduate system where there are no majors. And that um, really has, I think, successfully encouraged our students to embrace interdisciplinarity. We now as many more or double or triple majors as any institution in the United States. Um, let me repeat that. that. We attract students who are interested in integrating uh, fields. Um, we attract students who are interested in how uh, spaces in which fields collide. Now, I'm going to share one story, uh, which I think epitomizes what this is about and the upside of this, of this pro um, process. A few years ago, a team of Tulane students entered something called the Big Idea Challenge, which was a national spacecraft design competition hosted by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Uh, the Tulane team was made up of six undergraduates and one graduate student who they were competing against 28 other top schools with all the great names in aerospace. Most, in fact, all the other teams were made up of students in aerospace, formal aerospace engineering programs, as you would expect. Not the Tulane team. We don't have an aerospace team. Our team had students from biomedical engineering, architecture, economics, engineering, physics, and other disciplines. They allowed them to think this in approach, to think out of the box and approach the challenge with a level of innovation and creativity that far exceeded what the other uh, participants had. As one of the faculty advisors explained to the national media, he said, quote, our hybrid cross-disciplinary team embodied the Tulane vision of finding innovative solutions from totally different and unique perspectives. It was, un it was unlike anything the judges had ever seen at NASA. And I'll show you the pictures of what they provided versus the MIT and other schools. Totally, totally different. So what happened? Who won the competition? Now, obviously, I wouldn't be telling you the story if, if Tulane didn't win the competition. Um, you know, that, that wouldn't be the right takeaway. But in, despite their lack of aerospace experience, Tulane team won the competition against all the top aerospace teams in the United States. Just read an article about Nobel Prize winners, how Nobel Prize winners disproportionately come from people who are crossing fields, um, who connect between. Uh, and in that sense, I think this, this uh, perfectly illustrates our space in education of getting students who cross fields. The third change which has occurred in recent years has been more incremental, but no less impactful. Uh, we've uh, launched a whole series of new research institutes and initiatives uh, that can really be traced back to Katrina, um, because while they grow out of different fields and areas, what they really are is they uh, reflect the increased importance of translational research. Um, and I think we are living in a world we see uh, the importance of translational research in a way we had not seen 25 or 30 years ago. And I mean in, in engineering, in medicine, uh, in all sorts of uh, um, in energy environment, all sorts of different areas. Uh, obviously, a university which is founded as a medical school was fertile ground for these. I could go through the various institutes, we environmental, the biomedical, uh, Bywater Institute and Department of uh, River and Coastal Science, we have a brain institute that brings together people uh, from uh, various neurological neuroscience fields and physics, and energy institutes, law, business, engineering, uh, you know, source of great um, research on wind energy and other areas. Um, it, it, in a sense, there are just so many different areas in which we're able uh, because of the way we're structured to bring people together. Uh, and finally, of course, centers of excellence on infectious diseases. Um, and fundamentally, this has allowed us, 
I think it rolls back to our founding in a medical school. It rolls back to Katrina, when in a sense we sort of had to break down all the barriers. And COVID, in a sense, updated it. It really brought us, um, uh, in a sense, to a different university. Just the benefits to you know, university presidents uh, in the room, it's had a huge impact, positive impact, on things like funding. Our research external funding has gone up 75% over the last um, five, six years, um, which may be the highest uh, of any major university uh, in, the, in the United States. And our applications, you know, undergraduates who are attracted to this, not attracted to everybody, not attracted to a majority, but attracted to certain people, who uh, students who really want to become part of this, have gone up 40% um, over this period. And it, it's, uh, again, our selectivity rivals, um, you know, some Ivy League schools as a result of this. What I'm talking about isn't for everyone, but it's, it's in a sense our path. So this leads me to my final sort of observation, uh, which is, and I've, I've referred to, is this, in a sense, outward vision being manifest itself in a new campus, in a new, in a certain place. Um, Tulane is currently engaged in, in a holistic and revolutionary revitalization of the New Orleans downtown area, um, where our schools of medicine, public health, and social work are located. We have a located there, but we really don't have a campus, uh, not a place. Um, and what we're doing is we are building around it a 14-block campus um, as part of it, expanding these schools. It's, it's a, it's a physical holding of the expansion and research. It's moving students down there. It's using, leveraging our, um, our finances to bring other people in as part of it who want to be part of this um, effort. Ultimately, we're uh, viewing we'll generate over 300 million in research funding, host five to loan schools, and create store, uh, scores of startups as part of it. Um, so I wanted just one thing that, um, for those of you who do remember Katrina at all, um, there was a, a building uh, charity hospital that was brought to its knees in the center of Coeur d'Alene as, as of Katrina. It flooded, people died there. It's laid vacant uh, since Katrina. It is gargantuan. It is a million square feet. For those of you who've been to the Superdome uh, in New Orleans, it's six Superdomes. And it sat there um, literally um, uh, in the center of the campus um, and, and, and was, in a sense, abandoned uh, by the city. Our efforts in building this sort of expanded space involve the, in a sense, rebuilding of charity. We're going to become uh, a third to a half tenant. We're moving our school of public health there. Uh, research expansion uh, will be there. It, it will really uh, be critical, the expansion research, as well as, I should say, uh, we really want to, uh, in a sense, create startups. We want to create businesses, you know, the, the medicine and education and uh, the ability to create businesses out of this by creating a downtown campus uh, to support uh, entrepreneurs. Um, I, you know, for those of you who've sort of been following the United States, um, we obviously all know about Silicon Valley and Stanford University. Um, but uh, there are some incredible recent efforts. Notre Dame uh, in South Bend, Indiana, has launched a similar institute in 2017 and created uh, literally 145 startups. Um, I don't know any of you who've been in South Bend, Indiana. Um, if you're planning to visit uh, the states on holiday, it's probably not the first destination that would come to mind. It's probably not the second destination that would come to mind. It's probably not the 50th destination that would come to mind. Uh, and it's no wonder Steve Case, who started AOL and is talking about what places would be fertile grounds for innovation and startups, identified New Orleans because of the creativity, because of the, 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 the sort of the, the joie de vivre, the music, and so on, as a fertile place um, for startups. Um, and we've seen, as I said, the, the power of that. We've seen it. I, I don't need to talk about Silicon Valley and Stanford. A better case, actually, is Pittsburgh, which was a former um, sort of Rust Belt city that's been, re, in a sense, rejuvenated 
um, uh, by Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh uh, Medical Center. Um, and our goal really is to rejoin those ranks. So uh, let me just say, uh, concluding side by side with the Innovation Institute, our research labs and teaching facilities, we're also providing as part of this creating a neighborhood with apartments and retail, drawing in the community. Um, so this is a role of a university in research um, and the funding of research. Um, it's also a university providing the startups um, that can come out of that research. And it's also creating a neighborhood because um, we, in a sense, have the ability to move people and create a neighborhood uh, in a way that, that um, individual employers really uh, do not have that ability. Um, and, and really to generate others to come in. I should note um, one of the, I don't know how to evaluate this, but we purchased land and we're developing, and, and now all the private equity um, people are buying land around <laughs> where we are. I think that's a good thing probably, but um, in any event, the point is we can create a momentum in markets as, uh, at, um, as part of this and setting uh, the stage and also leading to really to hoping to diversify uh, the, the community, the financial base of the community, and really um, providing a sustainable future for the city we call home, the city we love. And quite, quite frankly, that's the ultimate expression and demonstration of what an outward facing uh, university um, is about. Um, I want to go back to the Daniel Moynihan quote that if you want a great city, you build a great university and wait 200 years. Um, obviously, that rests partly on the assumption that uh, literally universities don't change very quickly. 200 years is a long time. Uh, but needless to say, we plant the seed, we create an exchange, and ultimately can in influence our communities in, in sub substantive ways. Uh, but also, uh, literally, we can see right now uh, the incredible impact of the idea revolution. Uh, with the idea revolution in biotechnology and so on, the change can be much more rapid, um, and I think uh, that much more important. Higher ed has been under siege lately. Uh, every university president in the room can appreciate that fact. I certainly can appreciate that fact. Um, that's partly because we're more visible than ever before. We've come a long way from the old university model when universities were finishing schools and pupils retreated from society into libraries and labs behind ivy-covered walls. Um, and for us at Tulane, when the world intruded in the form of Hurricane Katrina, this led us, when the world intruded on us, in a sense, to connect with the world in very substantive ways. We learned about rebuilding ourselves and then rebuilding the community and the ways in which there was a synergy uh, between uh, those two. And this new campus is really a way of uh, honoring that legacy. Um, we, the pandemic was the same way for us, in a sense reinvigorating our relationship with the city, the city understanding, the, in a sense, the benefits that we provided. Um, and I think in the end, we've come out of it ahead, and I think the city has um, as well. So uh, finally, I did want to conclude, uh, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't note uh, the recent passing of Bud Zimmer, who was uh, the former president of the University of Chicago and delivered one of these uh, lectures previously. Um, he, uh, in a climate uh, where free, free speech has come under attack from all sides of the political spectrum, Bob was a tireless and fearless advocate for freedom of expression, really somebody known in the United States um, by that advocacy. So I'd like to leave you with a brief epilogue inspired by my reflection on Bob's impact on higher education. I've been talking about the ways that crises can offer us opportunities to prove our worth to our communities. The recent push towards censorship represents a crisis, at least in the United States, of free expression and an opportunity for our sector to demonstrate our value. Universities are one of the few institutions in society that bring together individuals from a wide variety of backgrounds and perspectives to live, learn, and work together in an intensely relational atmosphere. In a way, 
We are a microcosm of today's society, make up of unique individuals pursuing their own passions in a million different directions. University presidents don't serve as autocratic leaders telling everyone what to do. Sometimes we wish we were, but we don't in any way, shape, or form. We oversee a decentralized, dispersed community that allows creativity and challenges to bubble up. That affords us a unique potential to facilitate civil discourse and find common ground across ideological lines. Just as Tulane's brought together insights and ideas from different disciplines to win the NASA Big Idea Challenge. Universities really can and must bring together scholars, leaders, and community members to find innovative solutions to the problems we all face today. So if we tap into that potential, I truly think that is the greatest service we as a university can do. And in, in Tulane and New Orleans, I think we have brought home to the community the value that we can serve uh, to the community. I really want to thank you um, for letting me uh, sort of pontificate about Tulane University and tell you a little bit about its unique history. I was very nervous by the fact uh, that Richard said at the beginning there'll be an open bar at the end of this. So I know you haven't been listening to a word I've been saying. You've been gearing up for the open bar. But uh, with that, I want to thank you uh, for your time and this invitation to uh, address this all guest group. Thank you very much. Hands up if anyone would like to come forward uh, with the first question. We have a gentleman at the back here waving his hand, and then a gentleman here, and then a gentleman here. Uh, here. Right, four questions so far. Excellent. Hello, thank you. My name is John Goddard. I was a deputy uh, vice deputy for the Civic University Commission, um, and also formerly deputy vice chancellor at Newcastle University. Uh, you spoke very eloquently about crises that have happened. What about future crises? We've had at the moment a lot of discussion between our Prime Minister and, and President Biden about artificial intelligence. What is Tulane University doing in preparation for AI impacting on your civic role? Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so so uh, you want me to give sort of a five minute lecture on the significance of AI to universities and the, uh, the global society. Um, I, I know it all, but it's a 30-minute lecture and we don't have enough time uh, for it at this moment. L let me say, um, uh, AI is one of the most fascinating issues facing everybody. It's sort of like this black box and you can read into it anything you want um, because I don't think we really understand it. I can tell you this, um, uh, we've dealt with every crisis, hurricanes and so on, by bringing groups of people together from different areas and talking them through. That's how we got through hurricanes and I don't And I, we've literally started exactly that um, on artificial intelligence, bringing groups of people together, uh, um, sort of free associating about speculating. I do think that uh, we make a mistake uh, in under, in thinking we understand how it's going to evolve. Um, so at this point, we don't have a, at Tulane at least, we don't have a roadmap of what we're doing, but we have a series of processes by which we're going to think about it. I've held uh, two all-day uh, conferences on it. We're holding another one um, so we can get to that. Having said that, um, I did do an op-ed in USA Today on the significance of, of AI. And it was, a, I thought, a balanced uh, analysis of the pros and cons. Um, you don't get to control the titles in, in USA Today. So the title, which had nothing to do with what I said in the article, said, we don't need to worry about AI. <laughs> so uh, read the article, but don't, don't pay attention to the title. Thank you very much. Uh, we had a question uh, on this table. Uh, this one here. Oh, yeah, wait for a microphone. And I'm going to go over... By the way, here, is that a green right tie? It is a green tie. It's a University of Exeter tie. Oh, uh, well, it's also a Tulane tie. So, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I thought you would, it was in honor of Tulane University. We are obviously two of 
Uh, all of us, whenever we go into a store, the first thing, if there's a green tie, we buy it, right? <laughs> so I have a lot of green ties. Well, Exeter's got m more in common, actually. We, we've got a, a real passion for interdisciplinarity. And so I was really excited by you, your ideas uh, about the, the single route into a, into a program. We're very proud of the way our students engage in iGEM and other such competitions, not quite as dramatic as your Tulane uh, NASA competition, but similar. <laughs> um, so I'm really interested in how you made the transition from what I imagine was a, a perhaps a more conventional offer to a successful single entry offer without terrifying your marketing department and everybody else in the institution. Because, you know, I'd love to go back to Extra and say, actually, you know, you know, I talked about curriculum for change. Well, we've got you know curriculum for change mark two, and we really want to drive this. Um, it's a, it's, it is a great question. First of all, um, it's not as if students don't major; they do major. They just don't declare a major or apply to a field until they've been at Tulane for two years. Um, so there's, it's not as if you don't major, but you attract a certain type of student who is more sort of eclectic and open uh, to that. Um, it is difficult. So if you're a faculty member in a field, it makes you more, I think, thoughtful about connecting with other fields. We have all sorts of professors jointly appointed. Um, we also do have problems, which I think may be what's behind your question, of um, we can't, in a sense, micromanage what fields our students are going to go into. Um, two years down the line. Um, so we sort of have a sense of where they'll be, but we can misfire, which we've had. We had explosions in undergraduate business. We now have explosions in engineering. Um, and, and you sort of have, it, that is a problem. Uh, but the, the compensating factor is it, and I think, embraces um, what this generation wants, which is uh, the ability to combine fields. Right, we had a question on this table here, I think. Wait for the mic. So. Uh, Dinah Kane, I chair council at Goldsmiths, Univer Goldsmiths University of London. Um, I was actually going to ask a very similar question about interdisciplinarity. Um, the world came into you locally with the crisis. Um, I assume the link with your choice to move forward was that you saw that teams working together helped solve that crisis locally. Um, you were just talking about bumps in terms of student recruitment, but overall increases in terms of research funding and recruitment right. that you relate to that is interdisciplinarity. But how do you also then relate that to some of the big world challenges that you were talking about and that John was mentioning in terms of artificial intelligence, things that are coming down the line? Do you think that's the right mix for students to be pursuing in terms of the future as well as the now? Um, great, again, a great question. And it's not as if I'm constitutionally opposed at all to specialization. Um, as an educational matter, I am, uh, I think that interdisciplinarity um, bends the mind. Uh, creates better, more educational opportunities. I mean, education is uh, personal in many ways. When I went to college, um, I was an undergrad at Harvard, they had a program for about 20 students, um, which they let them take any course in the university. Um, you could take any class, and you could major, and you could do whatever you wanted. Um, and so I was one of those, those students. Um, and I thought it just uh, was incredibly opening intellectually for me and sort of mapped my life uh, later on. I mean, there is data on Nobel Prize winners um, that disproportionately Nobel Prize winners come uh, from individuals who, who cross paths. But I, this is not a straitjacket, and I certainly don't want to suggest it's a straitjacket. It's rather a place, uh, a, a, a sort of an inclination we have uh, we attract students with, who are, who are uh, inclined to do this. We don't attract students who are not inclined to do that. Um, but we found it is, is very uh, important for this, for this generation. All right, we have a question here. The lady just there right, the mic's right by you. Great. Hello, Michael. Um, I'm here. 
I'm, I'm here, I'm here, sorry, hello. I'm Alison Johns and uh, Chief Executive of Advance HE. Uh, we're a development agency for the sector, not money, people, okay? And um, thank you for sharing that really fascinating personal story of, of you know, your journey through this. And something you said really struck me. You talked about the role of universities in creating momentum in the market. Could you just tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that and perhaps what we can learn from how you've done that? Right. Um, so, you know, as you know, many of you know, there, there, there are rich literatures on networks and uh, inflection points and um, uh, rational expectations. Um, and universities, uh, when they make commitments to areas uh, and they can back that up, uh, with future uh, research um, people um, can, in a sense, create their own momentum um, uh, for, the, uh, for the place. And what we noticed in um, the downtown was, you know, we sort of stuck our, um, you know, flag in the ground and said we're coming uh, and told everyone we're coming. And that creates different... Um, externalities and and that's what I mean we can we're big you know it's sort of the old um, one company town we can create a neighborhood we can create a place and once you do that you can lead other people to become part of that um, you know we we're not just employers uh, we we have students uh, we have uh, you know people who live as part of this community and and party and socialize as part of the community. So we can create that, and that's very important as well. But that's what I meant. Right, I've got a question for David here, and I'll come to gentlemen here and then over to David as well. So. President Fitz, thank you for your inspirational lecture, and even more for the inspirational work that you're doing at the university you lead and the work that your university does. I've got a question to ask you about creating a neighborhood. Um, and I apologize that I'm not wearing a green tie, but, <laughs> but my name is David Green, and I'm vice chancellor of the University of Worcester. And many years ago, my dad was at the electrochemistry lab at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so I feel we have a connection. And um, uh, 20 years ago, when at Worcester, we were starting our work to create the countries in Britain's first university and public library, we looked immediately to the United States because we were sure a university had done a university and public library in the United States. The only one we could find was San Jose State University. So I sent my colleagues to it and we learned a lot about what to do and also about what not to do. Um, and our idea for a university and public library was all created from the fact that we're one of the country's biggest and now I think probably best uh, teacher educators, and we had a fantastic children's library, which hardly any children ever used, just a few staff children, for all the resources for our teacher training students. Now we've got a, the, arguably the best children's library in the country, full of children at Bounce and Rhyme, Bumps and Babies, and Wacky Wednesday. And they're all being inducted into learning from a very early age. And of course, the parents, uh, and the grandparents love the university because of this wonderful facility which has been created, and our students love it too. Are you doing anything similar in this new neighborhood you're creating? And what about all the other facilities that the university has, the sports fields, and the other ways in which you can connect with the community right. who otherwise would not connect with you? Um, again, these are great questions. That's a great question. Um, we, uh, we, I should note, as part of this downtown, we are, uh, uh, New Orleans is a charter school city. Um, they're no, not public, but they're all publicly funded charter schools. So we're looking to uh, position charter schools in, as part of this area. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a full court um, press in that regard. There are a variety of different initiatives we have, um, and I don't want to tout them because we're, we're still working them through, where we, in a sense, connect with uh, the local community, uh, literally can, uh, creating partnerships with charter schools around the city um, so that as, as part of supporting them, we do not have a school of education. 
Um, so uh, we don't have sort of a traditional uh, partnership in that regard. But we do provide um, lots of pipeline programs for high school students to study um, at Tulane University um, over the summer and during the year in our classes uh, to try and get them uh, sort of um, up to speed. There, there's uh, one piece of this, which is we're not as rich as the Harvards and the Yales, um, so we don't have the huge financial aid packages, but we did make a commitment to Louisiana um, for a no loan policy for individuals making less than 100000 They could come to Tulane without um, paying tuition. Um, and that was truly uh, intended to support the relationship with our community of Louisiana, which is a very poor state um, and not at the forefront um, educationally. Um, so there are a lot of different things, but I don't want to, we're not somebody you should go study. We're in the, we should come study you um, in terms of how we do this. Good. Two more people caught my eye, so I'm going to actually ask, if you don't mind, if we can ask the questions successively, and then uh, President Fitz might give a sort of final answer so we can stay on time. So, so gentlemen here, and then over uh, to David. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Peter Miskell from the uh, University of Reading. Um, in my <coughs> academic life, I'm sort of a bit of an organizational historian, and I was quite struck by the references that you made repeatedly, actually, to the sort of the origin story of Tulane uh, and the history of the, um, of, of the university. Was that a conscious decision, would you say, in the wake of, of the crises that you've described, to, to make that kind of conscious effort to reach back and to search for, 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 for historical... You, you kind of presented it as being, it's in the DNA, it comes naturally, but I was just wondering the extent to which that was. <laughs> Did Tulane say we were started as a medical school, so therefore we would res should respond to Katrina as a medical school? No. But I do think institutions have cultures um, that, that flow from sort of the people who are attracted to them over time. Um, and I've spent time at Harvard and Yale and the University of Pennsylvania. Tulane is very different. Um, from Harvard and Yale, much more on the University of Pennsylvania model for a whole lot of different reasons in, in that regard. Um, and I, you know, uh, you, you look at the place, you look at the people who are attracted to it, and I think you can trace that over time. It's an outward looking university. I, I, the very simple fact, I don't think there's a major American research university that would have adopted a public service requirement in the United States. Um, Tulane did, you know, and I, I think it's that culture. And then a uh, final question to David Sweeney, just on the table here. Uh, thanks, David Sweeney, Birmingham. I, th I mean, I think you've captured there what many people in this room want to do, and which I think Alison also mentioned, develop momentum in our communities for the transforming effect that university has. Uh, I think we struggle for the investment and I'm just interested in the balance there was at Tulane between uh, income that came from your core business, income that came from your own philanthropy, and the income that came external that was more into uh, Tulane and into the city uh, from uh, outside the area. How did you manage to do it? Because we want to do it. Um, um, I must say money's money and it's fungible. All of the above. I mean, literally, I'm, you know, as I've joked with many people, um, I'm a professional beggar. Um, and so, uh, literally, philanthropy is part of it. Um, you know, cr research funding has been part of it. We've been extraordinarily successful um, at generating research dollars, and they've exploded. That brings in resources. Um, as well as, and we become very attractive to students. Um, and some of those students, we give very generous financial aid, and others we um, charge hefty tuition. So, I mean, I think we've we've gotten resources. We're we are not in the position of all those universities, um, the the Harvards and the Yales and so on. Um, so we struggle, like you do, to get the resources for this. But um, the. <laughs> You know, to use a business, the ROI is huge on this, I think. That is huge for the community, huge for the university, um, and huge for our, our research. 
Uh, President Fitz, thank you uh, so much for engaging uh, so attentively uh, with the audience's questions tonight. And I think you can demonstrate from the number of questions in, in the room, and apologies to those who weren't able to uh, ask their question, that there is a genuine enthusiasm and interest in, in what you have to say and the lessons that we can learn from what you've put into practice that we can take away from this occasion tonight and look to learn those lessons and put them into practice also. Uh, in the United uh, Kingdom in institutions that are represented from across uh, the nation uh, tonight. And I assure you, we, you didn't come here just uh, for the free bar. It's been a wonderful uh, opportunity. I'm from, I'm from New Orleans. The new free bar was an important part of it. <laughs> well, I'm glad we could entice you over, if that was the case. But uh, it's been a, a, a wonderful opportunity. If we could have a, a round of applause before Richard closed proceedings. Anyway, I want to, Lisa, you've been a wonderful group. Questions have all been really excellent, um, uh, many of them which I struggle with as well. But um, I encourage you to think about it at your own universities, um, the ways in which your vision, your model, create, ultimately will affect uh, your community. Because to, to many, and I didn't really go into this, but we, we're all, at least in the United States, at a, a time of crisis in higher education. Uh, the public uh, legislators are constantly asking, you know, what, what, what's your role in society? Um, and to some extent, I view what we're doing as the answer to that, and I think it, it, it's a great thing. I've, I've really enjoyed this. I've never given a talk with a painting in front of me of a cricketer. I'm going to remember this. Uh, and I also don't want to stand in the way of the bar, so I should, I'll pass it off to Richard. Thank you.